Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring you the retrospective on UFC Fight Night Blaskovic or Blakovic versus Jacare. This was a pretty good card. Uh, some fights were a little bit of snooze, but some of them were certainly interesting. A lot of close decisions. We ended up going 5-6 and six on the evening. There, of course, was that draw that we'll get into where, you know, I'd... And I think things could have gone the other way. We probably would have got the fight wrong, but I think things could have gone the correct way. But let's get into it. Here's the show. All right, so starting out with our main event, an event that we did get correct, we had Jan Blakovich defeat Jacare or Ronaldo Souza via split decision. So I was a little concerned here because of the Brazilian judges that Jacare was going to get the nod here, but it would have been a really, really bad nod. In fact, it shouldn't have even been a split decision. It should have been unanimous. So the story of this fight really is that Blakovich manages to outstrike Jacare pretty handily, 71 strikes to 20, and he's able to stuff all of the takedown attempts of Jacare. I don't know if it was five or six, but all of the takedown attempts, all of the cage work, the clinch work was stopped by Blakovich. Uh, Jacare just... You know, we talk about this with a lot of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys. They just don't have the takedown authority or game technique in order to get things to the mat. And we saw this happen with Blakovich. Remember when Rockhold fought Blakovich and he tried to exploit what he thought was weak takedown defense on the cage and was not able to get him down? And I think, honestly, Rockhold, from a pure wrestling perspective, is actually better than Jacare. You might think I'm wrong on that, but I'm saying it's better, I think, in my personal opinion. Once he gets to the mat, obviously, that leads back to Jacare. And Jacare, you know, he didn't learn, I think, from looking at Rockhold, you know, Rockhold's attempt, but maybe that was his only real chance here. He knew that he probably couldn't hang on the feet, and he certainly could not, and he also knew that his only pathway to victory was going to be on the ground, so he had to try to keep pushing to the ground, pushing to the ground, but each time he would, he really had nothing. There were a couple of close moves where I thought the Blakovich was going to get to the ground and Jacare might take over, but at no point was Jacare able to get it to the ground, and so really at no point did I think that Jacare was in control. Now, from a pure actual octagon control perspective, you know, Jacare did have the advantage. He was, I'm going to say, stalling to a degree, fighting for those takedowns and taking away the range of Blakovich, but, you know, it... From a you know fight perspective, I don't. I think when it's you're going to draw it down the middle, you can't necessarily give the advantage to a guy that is seemingly stalling. And a lot of this falls on the ref. You know, if the ref sees him stalling, and he did towards I believe the end of the fight in the fifth round, break it up. Um, I, I think that's a good call. You know, you got to always be advancing position. You know, I understand that there's you know hand fighting. There's you know, movement towards position. And I'm not saying you can have a quick hook, but I think that Jacare probably could have been pulled off of Blakovich a couple of times to let them re-engage. And it could have honestly been to Jacare's advantage. You could have had another chance to reset and get a leg and get a takedown, you know, instead of just trying to grind, grind, grind on the cage. So was it honestly a split decision? I don't think so. I think it should have been unanimous with Blakovich. Uh, because of the way it played out. So we were able to get that one correct, and it was a good call. In the co-main, we had Mauricio Hua uh, tie, draw, Paul Craig. This was a bad decision in my personal opinion. Uh, I thought that Paul Craig won. He outstruck him 2-1. to one. He did manage to get a takedown. Uh, granted, I think Hua actually did win the second round. You know, Hua was able to control a lot of the top position. Uh, Craig wasn't able to do too much from his back. I think he overestimated his own, you know, b- uh, back submission game. And, you know, Hua uh, obviously was going for that ground and pound. He was trying to put it on him. Uh, ultimately, though, I think that Craig should have gotten the win here. I think that he, you know, really looked good in the first round. He definitely came back, ended up in top position at the end of round three. And I think that's two rounds to one right there. I don't think you can call this thing a draw. I at no point think there was a 10-8 round. And I think that Hua got a little bit of that hometown nod to save him from taking a loss. Uh, so I think they kind of robbed one from Craig here. You know, I, I would have been okay if it was maybe a split decision win, but to say it was a draw, I think is unfair. You know, there was a 28 to 28, and I just don't agree with that one. Uh, so honestly, I think Paul Craig should have won. I would have gotten the fight wrong, to be perfectly honest, but I think that Paul Craig should have won this fight. Uh, instead, it ends up being a draw, so I can't count it for us or against us. 
you know, on the record. So that's why out of the 12 fights, we went 5-6 and six for the 11. So it is what it is. And, uh, hey, I mean, hats off to Hui. He showed that he can still hang with good talent. Uh, but I think Craig ultimately got the win there. In the next contest, Charles Oliveira, or Doe Bronx, and Jarrett Gordon. Uh, what can I say about Oliveira? You know, I said this in the lead-up coming into the first podcast we did for the picks. Uh, I was obviously picking Gordon because of the numbers, but I was given a heavy, heavy sprinkle of salt in there to say that you should not take that fight. That was a bad one to go with. The only fight I really honestly felt confident on was the uh, Blakovich fight. That was it. All these other fights, I think, were really, really suspect and uh, you know not the best numbers fights to go on. But anyways, Charles Oliveira, I mean, what can't the guy do right now? He has most submissions in the UFC. He's got a knockout streak going. He's looking phenomenal, and he needs an opponent. He called out, I don't, this was a stupid call, but Conor McGregor, there's no point to call Conor at this point. He's going to fight Gaethje, Cowboy, and try to get back to, to Khabib. I, I think those are the only options for Conor. So any, anytime you call his name out, it's stupid. The other one is going to be interesting, though. That's Paul Felder. Paul Felder was the last man to give Charles Oliveira a loss in the UFC several years back. Obviously, Edson, the Edson Barboza fight, Felder's coming off of a win. I think it's a good time to match them up. And I think, honestly, Oliveira will be able to defeat Felder the second time around. He's looking so good right now. His hands are crisp. His, you know, his submission game is still there. This guy is extremely well-rounded. And I said it. I think he's a guy that could fight a Khabib-like competitor. Granted, he's got to fight the better talent. He's got to prove he can do it the higher echelons. But on the streak, on the role that he's on, on the focus that he has in his mind since his daughter was born, I think that he can bring it. And I think he can be a real problem for the guys above him. He's going to climb out of the basement, and I think he's got a shot at cracking into the top five to maybe get a shot at the big guy. So we'll see what happens there. Obviously, there's also the whole thing with Khabib. How many more fights will he have? He doesn't necessarily want to have a long legacy like a GSP at the top. He kind of probably wants to do three to four and go home. That's what I'm understanding. So will they ever clash? Will it ever happen? I don't know, but I think the Oliver is on a roll, and I'd like to see that one uh, take place if possible. Either way, we did get it wrong. Um, you know, the numbers just didn't shake out uh, for Gordon, and they didn't shake out in my own heart or gut metric, as it were, either. In uh, the next one, we had Andre Muniz defeat Antonio Ahoyo. And in this one, you know, Ahoyo looked good like for the first 10 seconds, and then it was really all Muniz. Um, I think that uh, Muniz c- kind of broke Ahoyo. Uh, there was that uh, that knee on the ground that really shouldn't have been a knee, and Ahoyo was trying to sell it and, you know, get a breakup and maybe get a point taken away from Muniz as, as being a quote-unquote illegal blow. It's actually legal upon retrospective, but Ahoyo looked like he was broken in there. Um, Muniz really put it on him. Once he really had him on the ground, it was beating him down. Uh, I think Ahoyo lost what he thought was his one path to the victory, which was an early stoppage of a guy like Muniz and the takeaway, his tool set before he get a chance to go to work. So in that one, you know, um, we got it wrong, and it is what it is. Um, but a good fight by uh, Muniz. He, he looked like he had the heart of the line in there and that he really wants to be in the UFC. And I'm not sure Ahoyo really was ready yet. So we'll see what happens uh, for both those guys in the future. In the next one, we got a prodigy in the making. We had Wellington Terman defeat Marcus Perez. So Perez looked really good. He was throwing a lot of spinning shit in there, spinning back fists, spinning elbows. He was making it look like a really fun fight. And Terman had to shut down the hype train by taking him down. He got two takedowns on the affair. He did get some ground and pound in. Um, he, he looked just really good. Wellington Terman, I think, is going to be a talent. And I really like the contest he put on. I did have Perez. You know, I think Perez could have won, you know, had he connected a little bit better. He did get some great shots in there. But the chin on Terman is just really there right now. And so he wasn't really able to put a hurting on Terman like I thought he was going to be able to. So we got this one wrong, but watch out for Terman. He is a complete fighter, and he's going to be interesting. In the following contest, we had James Krause to be Sergio Morais. We did get this one correct. Morais, again, you know, similar to that Arroyo fight, or Hoyle, uh, similar, you know, breaking of spirits. I think that after the first round, you know, it, all, it was all Krause. Krause outstruck him over 2-1. to one. Uh, he was really, you know, kicking at the leg of Sergio. He had a hard time standing. And when he finally got the KO deep, deep in the third round, I mean, it was half half gas tank expired, half damage. I mean, he beat the crap out of him. Um, heart of a, again, heart of a lion, heart of a champion in Marais, you know, to keep going with that kind of, 
you know, damage and onslaught coming towards him. So, you know, hats off to Marais on that one. You know, it was really great to see him go out on his shield, you know, in some respects from, you know, excitement fan perspective. But, you know, uh, you know, it's also hard to watch too. I, I hate to see a guy, you know, leave it all in there so that they can never come back and do it again. So, I don't know. We'll see how things play out for Marais in the future. I like Kraus, though. He did pick up the win and were able to call it correctly. In the next one, Ricardo Hamos uh, defeats Eduardo Garagori. I called Garagori, and he looked okay to start uh, <laughs> like the first few moments. Uh, but those takedowns in the first round pretty much just uh, shut the door very early on Garagori. And rear naked choke set in, and we pick up an L on that one. It just kind of is what it is. In the following contest, we had Francisco Trinaldo defeat Bobby Green. Uh, this was one that uh, I don't agree with at all. I think that uh, uh, Trinaldo picked up a little bit of that hometown edge. I think that they gave him a win he didn't deserve. You know, from a pure damage perspective, yes, Trinaldo did hurt Green at times. But from a technical striking perspective, he outstrikes him 50 strikes to 31. He scores an additional takedown. He makes four passes on the ground. I mean, yeah, Trinaldo goes for, the, you know, the submission attempts uh, a couple times and, and scores one. I think with the uh, the Kimura in the second round, uh, by scoring, I mean attempting it. And you know, I don't. I don't think this was a good decision. I think Bobby Green did enough to win. Uh, he definitely did enough to get a split decision. But I was saying it to my wife. While I was watching. I was going to say I think Green's winning, but they're going to give it to Trinaldo. It's too close, and you always got to side with the Brazilians in that one. So honestly, if you're ever betting on this and you really don't want to go with my pick, or you're not really sure what, to, just take the Brazilian. You, you really can't go wrong if it goes to decision. Uh, they, they, especially the under, like the main event, they, you know, like the Jacare Bokovic fight, even though it was a split, uh, you know, I don't think they were going to give it to Jan, uh, sorry, give it to Jacare, uh, but, uh, they, they'll always make it close. They'll make you think, they'll make you wonder, uh, when all eyes are on them, they really honestly usually come through by not giving the fight away to the, uh, you know, the Brazilian, but on the undercard stuff, the stuff that's like, you know, low expectation, uh, you know, low watching, um, not the spotlight on it. I think that they'll give it to the Brazilian. This is exactly what happened with the uh, Bobby Green fight. So, anyways, we got that one wrong, and I, I disagree with it, but it doesn't matter. It is what it is. All right, next contest. Randy Brown defeats Worley Alves. Uh, Randy Brown looked phenomenal. He got that triangle choke in the second round, early in the second round. And uh, Worley Alves looks like a decent talent coming out of uh, the you know Brazil, but uh, Randy Brown was just on another level, and uh, Worley Alves didn't really get a chance to do too much. He did get some takedowns in, but couldn't really do too much with him. And then uh, you know we had kind of a sad affair here in the next one. Uh, also, the Randy Brown fight we did get correct, uh, by the way. But in the next one, kind of a sad affair. Uh, I did pick Hedem Barrow, but this guy's done. You know, uh, he I don't think he has anything left. Yes, he was former champion. Some people still come to see him. They announce it, you know, that he was former champion. When he gets into the octagon, it's one of his, you know, accomplishments. It's on his resume, but it's time to hang it up, man. Uh, he has not won a fight in quite some time. He just, he just is not looking good. Lost to Sterling, Keller, Uhl, Sanders, and now Andrade. And then, you know, even when he did beat Philippe Nover, you know, he had two losses before that to Stevens and Dillashaw. So in his last, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Eight, eight contests? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Jesus Christ. Eight, he has 12% winning uh, in his last eight contests. You know, one out of eight is not good. And this streak started in 2015 when he lost the belt to Dillashaw. You know, I, it, it's, it's not a fight that, you know, he shouldn't be fighting anymore. You know, I don't think he should. You know, he was really down on this card. I think that's a message from the UFC to say, hey, man, you know, you're, you're our third event to take place this night. Hardly anybody's there to watch this thing, and we're putting you in there. You got to win. You got to move up the the ladder. And I think if he did win, you know, they might have given him another opponent. You know, he could have made that claim. Also, he was moving up to 145. Let's just throw that out there too. You know, he did move up weight class, and we've seen guys when they change weight class, sometimes it doesn't work out. Uh, save for Darren Till in his last contest, but a lot of times it doesn't work out, and uh, you know, it, it's just a bad look. So. I, I hope the best for Burrell. I hope he's able to do something else in his life, but I think fighting is not for him anymore personally. You know, nobody can say when a fighter should hang it up, I guess, unless you hold the purse to these things. Uh, but if I was at anything uh, that I could personally say to him, you know, that was in his best interest. This is not a thing. You know, the guy's made a lot of accomplishments in his career. Um, but if I could say something in his best interest, I think it'd be time to hang it up. And that's my opinion on that. So uh, in the last two contests, though, we had some ladies' bouts. 
And we had Ariane Lipsky defeating uh, Isabella Padua. And we had uh, uh, De Padua. De Padua. We had DePadua take an L on this one, and we picked up a W, as well as the Tracy Cortez fight. We picked up a W on that one. So we started out pretty good, and then, you know, we kind of win-loss, win-loss for a little while, and uh, we took a good bit of L's towards the end there, and then, of course, the draw that, you know, neither, went either way. But I did have Hula, so I was probably going to lose that one anyways. Um, but yeah, so we went five and six, not the, not the best, not the worst, you know, I, I definitely was not, uh, you know, on the winning percentage side of things, you know, coming in under 50, but it's these international cards, you know, they're, they're really hard. A lot of the fighters just don't have a lot of data. And, and so it just makes for, you know, way more risky stuff. And I'm still standing by that, you know, you don't put money on the international card. You don't try to spread the risk. You know, the only one I said I felt confident about and I put on the Patreon was Blakovic. You took Blakovic. You did well. I think you picked up, a, you know, some good money here. Uh, he was, I think, uh, I think he was a favorite, but not like the craziest favorite. And, uh, you know, you won some money there. I didn't feel confident. I was saying anybody else was going to win this. In fact, the only one I probably would have felt confident enough about to say something, but it would have drove in the face of the numbers, would have been the Jared Gordon Charles Oliveira fight. Charles Oliveira, you know, I didn't see him losing. You know, I didn't see him winning in the way he did, you know, catching him with that great counter shot. But, uh, you know, he picked up a phenomenal win there. All right. So, unfortunately, you know, we have kind of a layoff here. Uh, so the UFC has just been going week after week after week for a while. But now we actually have to wait until Pearl Harbor Day. So December 7th, the day that will live in infamy, is going to be the day where the UFC goes to Washington, D.C. And where uh, we, Alistair Overeem is going to take on Jahirzo Roizenstruck. And so this is an interesting card. You know, there's nothing really... Too much to blow your hair back here. Mickey Gall, Carlos Condit is a good one. I, I like the natural born killer, even though he's been on kind of a, a rough run of things lately. Uh, versus Gall is a very, very good fight. Um, Cody Stamen and Song Yedong is actually not the worst fight in the world. Song Yedong actually isn't looking too bad. Um, he's got a four fight win streak going, and uh, we have Cody Stamen coming off a win of his own. But Song Yedong is actually somebody to watch out for, and I think he's actually. A very good one to watch on this card. Stefan Struve, Ben Rothwell. I'm not really too crazy about that one. Uh, Aspen, Lav, uh, Aspen Lad, Yana Sky is actually not the worst contest. I got probably take Lad in that one. She's looking pretty good. We got Rob Font versus Ricky Simone in that one. That one's also looking really good. Tiago Alves, Tim Means, not too bad. Chris Fishgold is going to be in it, but I don't know the guy he's fighting. Billy Quantinello. Does Quantinello even have any fights here in the UFC? Uh, no, he's going to be a debuter. Uh, so we'll see how that one goes. I imagine Fishgold will be able to grapple his way to Vic. Oh, no. Uh, he must have a Dana White Contender Series because his numbers are way off the charts. He's over 12 landed strikes per minute. That's, that's a little ridiculous. That's definitely an outlier. And then, yeah, those are. I think those are probably the best fights on the card. You know, I like Chris Fishgold in general, but this is competition. I don't think it's anything that you should, you know, interrupt your, uh, you know, whatever you're watching, whatever you're doing to go see. Uh, but definitely try to check out those Rob, uh, Rob Fawn, Ricky Simone card is good. Connit and Gall, Ladd and Kutinskaya, and then I think Over and Rosenstruck are really the best ones on there. Everything else is a little meh. Uh, so we got kind of a, you know, a little weak card, I think, going into what's going to be a very interesting one. Because uh, coming up on December 14th, so the week after, excuse me, the week after, we're going to have Usman versus Covington, UFC 245. That one is looking like it's going to blow the roof off of things. Uh, it's nothing but highlight reels there. Kamara Usman, Colby Covington, Max Holloway, Andre Volkanovsky, Noons and Durandame, Marlon Moraes, Jose Aldo. is uh, bantamweight debut, by the way, for Aldo in that one. Peter Ian, Uriah Faber, excellent fight. The California kid coming back. I'm looking forward to hearing Tupac on the entrance. Uh, then we also have Matt Brown in that one. Excellent fight. Kai Kara France going to be on that one, taking on Brandon Moreno. Kai Kara France is definitely a talent on the upswing right now. I do like him. Uh, Viviane Arusha, Jessica I. Uh, you know, you know, not, the, not the craziest fight, but not too bad for the ladies. And then a uh, really good one. This one's flying underneath the radar. Jeff Neal, Mike Perry. That one is one to watch. I'm really excited for that one. And so that kind of takes us through really the uh, the month of December. We really got nothing else to talk about uh, until then. So what I'm probably going to do is try to do something, I guess, another beer or liquor review to get something out there. 
Uh, I'm not sure. You know, we'll probably have to do it Saturday. I think we're just going to take a the Tuesday off on the podcast. We got the Sam 76 review that just came out, so there's a little extra content out there for you guys to look at or watch or listen to, whatever. So, yeah, that's where I think things are at. Um, I feel confident about maybe going in and doing some betting on the uh, Pearl Harbor Day card. So, we'll see how that one plays out. And yeah, so until I speak with you again next time, happy fight picking.